need to stay where the light is. Doesn't matter how dark it is on the other side of the window. Be where the light is. We talked about we need to rest in the light, and we need to find rest in the, in the spirit and the power and the truth of God. We need to find peace in the middle of chaos because where he is, there is peace, and there is joy, and there is strength in our rest. And we talked about dying to the darkness, not allowing the things in the dark to destroy us, but to give them over to surrender to the fall so that God can take something broken and make something beautiful out of it. The fall. But this week, I want to... I want to look at it from a different perspective. I want to bring a different character to play from this scripture. And, and not just about the fall, but something different. So starting in verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Again, we talked about this last week. They're doing what we're doing now. They're having church. And Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. And there were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled. And a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on speaking. Same story, different character. And this morning, I want to focus on a character we see in verse 9. A young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill. This morning, I don't want to talk about Eutychus again. I want to talk about the window. I want to talk about the window because the truth is, is that God has given each and every one of us a window. He's given us a window of time. He's given us a window of opportunity. He's given us a window for which we can live and make a difference. Scripture tells us clearly that that, per that difference, that purpose of the window is to know God and to make him known. Nothing else in this life matters. That's what the window is. We have this time, this window, in order to transform the world around us with the love and the hope and the passion of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I want to talk about the window, and the title of it is, we're going to go through a bunch of idioms here tonight, or this morning, as the, as the points, but the one thing I hope that you're implored not to ever do is don't shut the window. Don't shut the window. So this morning was simply called, Don't Shut the, Widi the Window, Idioms to Live By. If you don't know what an idiom is, I'm going to give a little text here. It's simply a common phrase or a word that means something completely different in a new context. So, it's raining cats and dogs, is an idiom. It's hotter than Hades, is an idiom. But I relate to it on a daily basis in Kansas. Idioms to live by. So as we get going, I want to first define window in the most physical sense. In case you don't know what a window is, and you've lived your entire life without any understanding of a window. It is simply a passageway that allows light, air, sound, anything to move in and out, to and from. It's a passageway. And there's a lot of reasons that we need to understand that we need to keep the window open and not shut it. First of all, Scripture tells us, not just in our phys the physical, but in the spiritual windows, that God desires to give wisdom to those who ask for it. He gives abundantly and without, without favor. That he gives his knowledge. That he gives peace. He gives joy. He gives strength. He gives rest. All those things are things that God desires to passage through us through the window he has given. Not shutting the window. So as we go this morning, I mentioned idioms. Each, each point we're going to have today is going to be an idiom that, that has been spoken over time. Some of them you might be like me and I've never heard before until preparing for this, and others maybe you've used on a daily basis. But the first reason that we need to not shut the window God has given us is because it is only a small window of opportunity. We've only got a small window of opportunity. This idiom simply means it's a limited time of opportunity to accomplish anything or something that's set before us. The window of opportunity we have today is minute. It is minimal. It is, it is just a fragment of time. We don't have enough time available to shut it. It has to remain open. In James chapter 4, verse 14, he says, You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You don't know. So what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. A mist. And we live so much of our life thinking that it's been so, we have so much time and it's been so long. And, and um, I would still consider myself young as most people would. But I do realize that the age I am now, life feels a lot shorter than it did when I was nine. And the older we get, the shorter life seems. And we've heard the illustration of that dash on the headstone. That is the shortest timeline there is. And in the moment, we feel like that 85 years that God blesses us with may have seemed so long or so short. But as we get older, we realize how short it is, how small the window is. And I've heard 
a lot of different stories from people that I've known and loved over the years that have passed away and, and went on. And I'd like to say they all went on to glory. And I hope they all did, but some fruit would, would want to specify contrary. But I've heard two different sayings. Either one was, I've lived a good life and left nothing on the table. And the other is, I have a lot of regrets. It's a small window. It's a small window. We're just amidst. We're here and gone. So the time we have to make an impact on the world is minimal. It's minimal. We can't take advantage of, of the time by wasting it and shutting the window because maybe it's too cool or it's too breezy. Maybe we're a little too tired of what God keeps saying. Maybe the voice or the wind that he gives is a little bit too much. We need to separate from it. We don't have time for that. There's not enough time for it. So what I want to ask us today is how should, how should we use a small window of opportunity? How, how should it be taken advantage of? And simply put, you, we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 and Luke 10, 27. But it says in 1 Thessalonians to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then in Luke 10, 27, Jesus tells us you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. How should we spend this window of opportunity? By being joyful by being thankful, by being devoted to God and loving God and his children with everything that's in us. That's how we use the window. And if we ever go a moment or a day or a time where our love for people is outweighed by our love for ourselves, if we ever go a moment where we are criticizing what we should be thankful for, we've shut the window. I want to share a story with you guys that I, I recently heard this week, and it, it's blown my mind, and I couldn't help but, but uh, shout in my spirit because of what God was doing. But in my flesh, there's been times throughout this season where I've wanted to complain. God, things are shut down unnecessarily. The economy is crashing. Things that we should be able to do can't be done. It's ignorant that rioters don't get the disease, but me at the restaurant can. And, and I, I make these, these points that we've all seen and we've all said, and, and I get frustrated with it. But then I heard this amazing story. A pastor on one of the Facebook groups shared it because he wanted to make it known. But on it, he said, a pastor friend of mine, in a, and in quotations, he put, a very large country in Asia. You fill in the blank. He said he's over there and, and he's asking for financial help and support because God has given them the opportunity of a lifetime. You see, with COVID-19 happening, not just in America, but in the world, this large Asian country's economy has also shut down and collapsed. People aren't spending money and going out like they always would because they can't. They're not free to do the things they want to do. So suddenly the women and children that have been sold as sex slaves are being released because they're not making a profit. And these young women and these young children are now suddenly find themselves without homes, without job training, without economic hope. And the church is rising up to provide and to give them shelter and to give them hope because they have gained their freedom back. And yet I've complained and I've criticized what God was using to bring freedom to the broken. I shut a window in my mind and in my heart and my spirit that God had opened for freedom of the lost. Don't shut the window. We've got to keep it open. It's a small window of opportunity. We have to find ways to allow ourselves to see the freedom that God is bringing, to experience the joy that he set before us, to see the hope and the freedom and, and the strength that he's producing through times of challenge. Even though wind's blowing hard and the house is getting breezy, God is doing something amazing. Don't shut the window. Second thing we have to do is, is we have to keep the window open and, and understand that it's, it's a window on the world. A window on the world. Has anybody ever heard this idiom before? Because I have not. This is a newer one to me. But this, this simply means that we learn about the views of the world beyond our own immediate understandings and situations. It simply means that I see the world through Scott's perspective. It means that I understand the world through Brother Joe's perspective. It means that I see life through, through Marlene's lens. I see the world beyond my own immediate understanding, my own immediate situations, my own immediate comprehension. Colossians 3, 10 through 14 says it this way, put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who creed him when there is neither Greek nor Jew, 
circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Tenderness, mercy, Kindness, humility, meekness, forgiveness, patience, long-suffering. These things are necessary for us to be able to see the world through the perspective of somebody else. It's required. It's really easy for me to sit back and to completely criticize the rioters and looters. Because I'm not going to say that the reactions, it's justifiable. I'm not going to say that at all. But the truth is, is that I can never minister to them until I come to a place where I can understand their hurts and their pains. I had a pastor friend of mine post on Facebook this week that he said, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me why I haven't shared my perspective on what's going on in the world right now. He goes, it's simply because I don't understand the black community. I don't understand it. I can't put a perspective on it. I can't weigh in my two cents because I don't know what they're going through. And he told a story like this. When he was younger, he had gone through Teen Challenge in San Diego. And after he graduated Teen Challenge, he started working and serving at Teen Challenge. And God put on his heart a passion to see young men change and revitalize, and it grew into young people in general. And so God began to stir this calling of youth ministry into his heart. And he started sharing it, and soon enough, a local church was about to launch this youth ministry and asked him to be the youth pastor. And he immediately said yes. He was on board. So he began to to canvas the entire area. They're in an inner city urban area, and they began to canvas it. The first night of youth ministry came along, and God blessed them with 90 students. 90. Of these 90 students, 89 were black and one was white. And the one white kid grew up in the same neighborhood as all the others. And so he gets up there, and he he thinks he's from California, and he loves these guys, so he's going to relate to them. And so he stands up there, and he preaches this message called, The Ghetto of Your Heart Without Jesus. And he's being clever, and he's being creative and relating to them, and he begins to preach about this ghetto. And he said he was just a couple minutes in, and his inability to understand their lives shone through. Because suddenly a young man stood up and said, man, you don't know the ghetto. You don't understand my life. You don't know where I've been from. You don't know my challenges, my hurts, and my pains. What are you talking about? And it said, the, my pastor friend said he ran off to his office and cried out of brokenness and, and humility. And he, and he was embarrassed. And he was throwing a pity party. And God finally said, he's right. You don't know him. Start. So he went back out to the young man. He said, you're absolutely right. I don't know your story. I don't know what the ghetto is like. I don't know the pain you've walked through. I don't know the hurt you've experienced, but I'd like to. I know a little bit about basketball. So let's go to your court. Let's go where you live, and we'll play a game. If I play good, if I play good and I win, you come back and give me another shot. But if I'm horrible and I flop and I'm a failure, you never have to see me again. The young man took his challenge, and he said he went out, and God let him play the best game of basketball in his life, and he got another chance to connect to this young man and these students, to understand their stories, to hear their pains and their struggles and their perspective, and he was able to begin to minister to them and touch their hearts and lives, because instead of assuming the perspective, he allowed himself to actually see it. We have to do that. We are so quickly to share in our own opinions without first understanding perspective. It's not to justify the reactions. It's not to justify the response. It's not to justify the wrong that's done on behalf. But it's saying, let me feel your heart. Let me feel your heart because what I know is the moment I gave my life to Jesus, he felt my heart. He saw my pain. He he saw the anger and the rage and the frustration and he met me where I was. And that's what we have to do. The understanding is that we cannot minister to a person that we don't understand. It'll never happen. The, the woman at the well who had been married five times, if Jesus didn't understand her, he would have never touched her. And if he had never touched her, she would have never run to the town to show them Jesus. My, my question and, and what God convicted my heart with is, is if we don't have the community running out to tell others about Jesus through our experience, is it because we're not taking the time to understand them? Is it on our end? Are we falling short? Are we asking the questions? Are we willing to hear the tough answers? 
Are we willing to love through the messed up responses? Are we understanding them? Because if we don't understand them, then we can't change our perspective from inward love to outward love. And that's what understanding does. It changes my focus on me to my focus on you. And what I want us to understand is simply this. Compassion, what all this is, compassion is a requirement for kingdom expansion. It's a requirement. We're never going to grow the kingdom of God without the compassion and the love and the hope of God. It's never going to happen. If we don't meet people where they are, if we don't have the the modern-day proverbial adulterous woman kneeling at us as we write in the sand and say, I don't condemn you either. If we don't meet them where they are, then they're never going to hear us when we say, go and sin no more. Because all they're hearing us say is, you're a sinner and stop. But they're not hearing the love and the hope and the joy of, I understand your pain. We have to have compassion as a requirement for kingdom expansion. And in fact, it's, 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 best, it's uh, clarified in Psalm 145.8. It says, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's slow to anger and great in mercy. And Jesus even re-solidifies and, and, and repeats the same truth in Matthew 9.36 when he's teaching to the multitudes. It says, but when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And what I have to ask myself is when I become frustrated and angry with the world around me, when I become angry with those who are living in nothing but fear from this disease that's going around, or people that are living in nothing but anger and hatred and vile toward the police or toward the system and the government, to the people that are shouting out against the church, am I seeing them in anger or am I seeing them as lost sheep without a shepherd? Our perspective, compassion, changes it all together. Compassion is at the core of God's heart. It's the core of his heart. If we were to be able to take the heart of God from his chest and we were to be able to go into it, it would be held by compassion, by his heart and his love and his need for humanity to know him. Compassion to bring them from from lost to found, from darkness to light. It is the core of who he is. And we have to learn to imitate that truth. We have to imitate his compassion, his heart, by allowing ourselves to see the world as he sees them. We have to be able to have a window on the world. We have to have new perspectives. And it's necessary because if we don't do that, if we don't have a new perspective and we're operating in our own flesh, we're operating our own our own thoughts, our own mindsets, our own perspectives, if we're not doing this through the, the spirit and the power and the truth of Jesus, then that brings us to part three. We, we make a better door than a window. And I know you know that one because I said it to my kids at least 20 times during the Super Bowl. <laughs> Get out of the way. You make a much better door than a window. But the truth of that is this. It simply means that you are blocking the line of sight. Blocking the line of sight. Let that sink in for a moment. If you are acting in your flesh, then you are blocking the world from seeing Jesus. Matthew 15, 14 says this. And this is from the mouth of Jesus. Ignore them. Ignore them. They are blind, guiding or they are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind man guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. So when we are acting in our flesh, then we are leading blind. And the truth is that Jesus has said if we are responding that way, if we're responding out of blindness, out of fleshliness, out of selfishness, out of our own uh, fleshly ability to comprehend and to lead, then he said that our words, our actions, our leadership, the best response for them is to be ignored. To not even be given any weight or any validity or any or any grasp of truth to just ignore it because we're in the way we're not leading in the direction of christ we can't lead through the spirit when we're living in the flesh when we're comprehending through our own we can't do it ignore it as long as we open operate our flesh as long as we continue to shut that window we'll constantly be steering the world away from christ you make a better door than a window Recap, idiom, a common phrase, word that means something completely different than its literal meaning. And I want to point this part out with that understanding. Don't make Christian an idiom for being uncompassionate. Don't change its meaning 
by your life. We've done this over time. We've taken people and culture groups and we've completely degraded and demeaned them with horrible idioms. For instance, don't be a gypsy. Don't be somebody who's untrustworthy, who's immoral, who can't be relied on. Or, or somebody took a little bit of extra money off the side. You jewed me. How horrible is that statement? How horrible is it? God's people have been turned into an idiom of being untrustworthy and being thieves and being money hungry. And how horrible would it be by our lives as believers that the world would look on us when it's broken and it's on fire and it's in pain and it's crying out for help and we turn an eye. And therefore they said, don't ask them. They'll just be a Christian. Don't make it an idiom. In fact, I almost titled this, this, this entire message, don't be such an idiom. I almost did it, but I decided to be a little bit more gracious. Don't make Christian an idiom for being uncompassionate, for not caring, for being unloving. Don't do it. Ephesians 5, 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. That means we have to imitate Him. That means we have to reflect Him. That means the heart of God has to be functioning through us as our heart. That we have to quit blocking the world's line of sight because our heart is beating with His. We have to quit shutting the windows. And the death of our flesh is the only way that we're able to imitate the heart of Christ. It's the only way that can happen. Imitation only happens through transformation. It's the only way. The only way. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. In Romans chapter 12, 2, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Confirmation, conforming, is never going to bring transformation. Conforming will never bring imitation of Christ. It will bring imitation of the world. And Scripture makes it clear that the world's father is Satan. So if we are conforming to the world's viewpoints, if we are conforming to the world's pains, if we're conforming to the world's anger, then we are conforming to Satan. It's the linkage. It's the only possible way because it is only through transformation that we can imitate Christ. The only way. It means thinking differently. It means speaking differently. It means responding differently. As Scripture says, it means being slow to anger and being compassionate of heart. We have to transform. And that only happens by keeping the window open. We can't transform if we shut the window. We might be able to see what God's doing out the window, but we're never going to hear what He's telling us if we've shut it. We're never going to be able to receive what he's giving us if we shut it. We have to keep it open so we can imitate, so we can transform, so we can show the world around us the heart of God. Transformation. Transformation. And then to transform, again, we have to destroy the conformation. We can't conform. We have to throw it all out the window. All that old junk. All those ways of thinking, all those angers and rages and pains and frustrations, out the window. All of it, gone. Throw it out with the old, in with the new. We have to throw it out the window. And out the window just simply means forgotten and disregarded. Forgotten and disregarded. I believe that Scripture says that when we have given ourselves to Christ and we've repented, that He throws our sins into a sea of forgetfulness. He's tossed it out the window. And yet we're so quick, so quick to bring it back, either against ourselves or against others. When he throws it out the window, he wants us to look ahead at what he's doing and not look down at what he's gotten rid of. Out the window. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past, putting it out the window, and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Forgetting about it, out the window, and looking ahead to what God is doing here and now. Looking for His heart, looking for His perspective, looking for His wisdom, His grace, His strength, His knowledge. Everything else out the window. Unproductivity, 
out the window. Fear feeding, out the window. Division breeding, out the window. Wasting of time, out the window. Anything that produces ungodly fruits, out the window. Look at Galatians 5, it talks about the acts of the flesh, all of it out the window. Forget about it, disregard it, don't think on it anymore because it's a waste of time. And as we said in the first point, our window is a small window. We don't have time to waste it with all this other stuff and junk. Get rid of it. Jesus tells a parable like this, that a, that a, servant, was, a servant was owing his master a lot of money. In fact, a lot of scholars say that it's so much money he never really truly could have repaid it. And the master sent for the servant, his wife, and his kids to be sold into slavery. And the servant ran before the king and fell down and cried and begged, Please, please don't do this. I'll pay you back. And it says the king had a lot of mercy and compassion and a broken heart for the servant. So he said, Wipe away all of his debts. You don't owe me anything. Go back. And so the servant went back relieved and freed and gracious. And it says he ran into another man who owed him just a small amount of money. And he says he grabbed the man by, by the neck, by the throat, and he began to shake him violently and, and, and require his money back. And when the man couldn't pay, it says he threw him in jail until he could pay it back. And some of the people around him saw and heard, and they ran back to the king and said, this is what your servant's done. And the king, understandably angry and indignant, pulled his servant back in and said, I forgive you so much. How could you not in return forgive another? So it says that he threw the man into prison to be tortured and beat until his payment was finished. Until the payment was finished. He didn't, he didn't put it out the window. He didn't see the world through somebody else's eyes. And he brought the junk with him. We have been given too much to not get rid of who we were. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, but forget all of that. Forget all of that. God's been talking about the things in the past. Forget about it all. The, the revivals of yesteryear, the beginning of Acts, when, when Peter stood up and preached the apostle Joel, when hundreds were healed just by the shadow touching, when, when healings were taking place, when the church was added to the number daily, says, forget all of it. It's nothing compared to what I am going to do. Nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. When there is no way, I'll make a way. I will create rivers and dry wasteland. When there is no life, I will breed life. I will do something new. So toss the old out the window. Forget about it. Because what God brings into the window, what he brings to us is always greater than what goes out the window. What we give to God is never close to, to, to as good as what God gives back to us, ever. Scripture says, who of you, if your child asks for a gift, will give him a snake? How much better are the gifts of God who loves you? The things we give God, the things we throw out the window, the things that we're afraid to let go of, that surrendered fall that we talked about last week, surrendering to it and allowing ourselves to be broken, the things that we're afraid to throw out the window are never anywhere close to as good as what God wants to bring us in the window. But we have to get rid of it first. You throw out fear and he brings boldness. You throw out anxiety and he brings peace. You throw out doubt and he gives confidence. You throw out division and he brings unity. You throw out anger and he brings joy. You throw out uh, hurt and he brings healing. You, you throw out immorality and he brings in, in forgiveness and strength. What you give is never as good as what you get. Put it out the window. Is God going to have you come on up here for me? Keeping the window open is the only way that we can ever receive everything God has for us. It's the only way. It's the only way that we can grow in what God wants us to grow in. It's the only way that we can receive the rain, the wind, the fire, the spirit of God in our lives. We can't shut the window. Because the truth is, is as great as it is that God wants to grow in us and grow us by what we receive through the window, it is so much better if we can allow ourselves to grow in God and to imitate him so that way the world can see a window through us. We get in the way too much. 
we get in the way too much. We respond out of our own selves too often. And when we do, we're often too slow to repent and to point back to Jesus. We stay shut. You know, Scripture tells us that wide is the road that leads to destruction, as narrow is the road that leads to salvation. The world is following us where we go, and we might be walking down this road, this narrow road of salvation, and they're trying to follow us. But if we get to a point where we're acting in the flesh, they can't get around us because we shut it off with the door. We've closed it off with ourselves. So I challenge you this morning as, as we move forward to, to ask God, God, what's the stuff that I've got to toss out the window? What's the stuff I have to get rid of? And how can I see the world through your eyes? How can I see their pains through their eyes? How can I understand them? How can I be a part of expanding your kingdom? It's the questions we have to ask. It's the raw questions that we have to seek answers for. It's that place of humility that says, God, what I'm doing has worked a little, but there's so much more that can be done. What do I need to do? So I'm going to ask you all to stand up this morning. And I'm going to pray over you, and then we're going to end with a, a few songs. But I want to challenge you. If God's speaking something to your heart, if he's convicting you, don't run from it. Embrace it. Embrace it and open that window wide open. And allow his restorative healing and his grace and his strength, his power, his, his anointing to overflow into your life. Because what has been shut off is finally opened again. Allow it to open. And give it over to God. Throw it out the window. So as we worship, if he's calling you to the front to worship, come to the front. If he's calling you to the altar, come to the altar. If he's, if he's calling you to, to call somebody up and repent call someone up and repent. Whatever the Spirit of God is leading you do as a reaction and as a response, as a repentance to His Word, do it. Do it. Because it's the only way we find freedom. It's the only way we receive all that God has for us. And it's the only way we are part of the response in pointing the world to Jesus. Don't shut the window. And if it's shut already, open it back up. Lord, we just love and we praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it is powerful. And God, we even thank you that it's double-edged. God, I thank you that it hurts. And as contradicting as it may seem to the flesh, I am thankful because that means it brings change. That means it brings repentance. That means it brings response. That means that it helps me become less of me and more like you. That means it gives me a continued hope of a future to come. So thank you, God, for the pain that comes with the conviction of your word. And thank you that you love us enough that you keep knocking on the window and you keep asking us to open it back up. Help us to not shut the window. Help us to get out of the way and help us to toss out the things that don't need to be here, God, because we have just a small window of opportunity. We love you and we praise you, God, and we worship you with all that we are. Amen. I will worship with all of my heart, and I will praise you with all of my strength. I will seek you. my days, and I will follow, Lord, all of your ways. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, Lord, I long to I will bow down, and I will bow down, and hail you as King. I will serve you, I'll give you
and I will trust you. Lord, I will trust you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, Lord, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, Lord, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Who am I? That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. 